Ultima Online, EverQuest. For most, these two are the founding fathers of the MMORPG genre. But in truth, there was a third. A lesser known title, yes, but one that not only influenced many MMORPGs that came after it, but is still fondly remembered even today. This forgotten father is Asheron's Call, a fantasy MMORPG developed by Turbine Entertainment Software and originally published by Microsoft. During its prime, Asheron's Call was known for its active projectile-based combat, random loot mechanics, open and deep skill systems, and a large and expansive world. However, it never quite managed to eclipse Ultima Online, which came before it, and EverQuest, which succeeded it. <laughs> and despite releasing a sequel, Asheron's Call 2 Fallen Kings in 2002, both Asheron's Call MMOs met the same eventual demise, the shutdown of all servers on January 2017. What caused this early pioneer of MMORPGs to lack the public attention of its competitors? And most importantly, what led to the eventual death of both this game and its sequel, after nearly two decades of life outside the spotlight? On this episode of Death of a Game, we will tackle the curious case of Asheron's Call 1 and 2. As both game worlds were known venues of mystery and intrigue themselves, we will need to be extra vigilant in documenting the clues as they present themselves. But don't worry, near the end of the video I will pull out my journal to recap everything for you guys if you couldn't pick up on all of the clues. The island of Dareth in a fantastic world of Arberian is calling for adventurers to join a quest for riches, which will take them across more than 500 square miles of a vibrant game world a map larger than that of EverQuest and Ultima Online. It's time for us to dive into the tale of the beloved, but mostly forgotten third pillar of the MMOs of old, Asheron's Call. The story of Asheron's Call begins in 1994, when Turbine Entertainment Software was founded by Brown University student Johnny Monsarat and several of his schoolmates, with the desire to create the world's largest game. We won't talk too much about Turbine here, as they kind of deserve their own video on their own rights, but what we need to know is that Asheron's Call had an initial development phase of approximately 3 years and 4 months, followed by another 8 months in beta. The team behind Asheron's Call was a group of around 30 developers, with an ambitious vision and a multi-million dollar budget. This million dollar budget hilariously started as CEO Johnny Monster at being in a car crash and getting an insurance payout, which he then used to pay himself to program an engine slash software, which helped Turbine name the funding for Asheron's Call, their first project, and MMORPG. This story and more can be found in a tell-all from Asheron's Call lead designer Tony Rabanagi, featured in the book Postmortems from Game Developers by Austin Grossman. Speaking of books, according to the design pioneer Richard A. Bartle in his book Designing Virtual Worlds, Asheron's Call was originally supposed to launch a year earlier than it eventually did, but was delayed due to an unspecified production issue. What set Asheron's Call apart, even in its earliest days, before we even talk about the story, graphics, or gameplay, was the technology involved in its development. Truly, the tech in Asheron's Call from an MMORPG perspective was revolutionary. I'm no server tech, but in plain terms, Turbine's engine had the ability to project a seamless environment or world using a dynamic load balancing server. Previously, games would assign a single server to a zone or instance, meaning some servers, like those for big trading centers, would be severely overworked, while others, like those for transitional zones, would be hardly used at all. By contrast, dynamic load balancing, as Turbine's strategy was coined, allowed for a true open world environment, where players can travel and explore the massive island of Dareth without the performance issues brought on by disproportionate server work. Asheron's Call was originally only supposed to support 200 players on a single server, but with breakthroughs in tech and server infrastructure, not to mention stiff competition from Sony's EverQuest and EA slash Origins Ultima Online, Turbine realized they were going to have to scale the game significantly to stand a chance. In short, they were going to have to put the M in MMO. The first M. The one that means massive, I mean. Turbine needed financing on their surely expensive MMORPG, as well as someone willing to ship and distribute the final product in a publisher role. With this in mind, they ultimately turned to tech giant Microsoft. Microsoft would include Asheron's Call as part of their MSN Gaming Zone portal, an interface where users could pay a daily or monthly subscription fee for access to various games. As a result of Microsoft's choice in business model, Asheron's Call would cost the box price, which was $40, as well as a $10 monthly fee. Asheron's Call launched on November 2nd, 1999. As such, it became the second ever 3D MMORPG after EverQuest launched earlier that year, and the third truly big MMORPG overall. 
The overall reception for the game was positive from both critics and players. Asheron's Call currently holds an 81 out of 100 on Metacritic and sold 57,000 copies by the end of 1999, earning revenues of 2.64 million in that same window. By the end of 1999, Asheron's Call boasted a 50,000 player subscriber base, a respectable number but still falling short of either Ultima Online's 150,000 and EverQuest's 200,000 players. Nevertheless, Asheron's Call had cemented itself as the third biggest MMORPG overall, a distinction it would retain until 2001 when it was usurped by Dark Age of Camelot. Critics and fans alike lauded the graphics in Asheron's Call, which for the time were absolutely cutting edge. Eurogamer, who gave Asheron's Call an 80 on Metacritic, said, Asheron's Call is a great game with wonderful graphics and awesome gameplay. Reviewers also highlighted the game's expansive world and how deep the character customization was in regards to player abilities. The skill system in Asheron's Call was at the time quite innovative, because the game didn't follow the class archetype structured popularized by the pen and paper RPGs. Instead, you could create more freeform characters based on different acquired skills, and progress in these skills through repeated use contributed to your overall skill level, such as typical in the mega hit RPG hit Skyrim to make it simple. This offered an unparalleled level of replayability, customization, and overall variety to the game that many would argue is still yet to be eclipsed to this day. Additionally, players were given more individual power and freedom than, say, EverQuest, as Asheron's Call was less reliant on grouping and group content than its biggest competitor was. In terms of combat, a defining aspect of Asheron's Call was its collision detection. Projectiles in Asheron's Call, whether spells or arrows, were aimed instead of being auto-targeted. You could even aim melee swings, high and low, as well as ranged attacks, resulting in different effects and bonuses. The game also had different hitboxes for the front and backs of enemies, allowing you to attack armored or even shielded opponents from the rear for more damage. For a game that came out in 1999, this is quite impressive. It's also further proof that modern MMOs don't really need to be stuck in the stone age of tab target combat. <laughs> I digress. While I won't claim that Asheron's Call had truly Twitch-based combat mechanics compared to, say, Darkfall, a game that was later inspired by Asheron's Call, battles are certainly more reliant on player skill than in other MMOs, as casting and cast strafing were very important for dodging enemy spells. Asheron's Call might not have been an action combat MMORPG, but compared to tab target competitor EverQuest, it certainly had the more dynamic combat system between the two. All critics agreed that Asheron's Call's allegiance slash patron system was very unique and honestly downright bold. In fact, I don't think I have seen anything quite like it since. Let me explain. In Asheron's Call, you can swear allegiance to another player. When you do, this player receives a little bit of experience from your travels in exchange for providing assistance or possible loot. This system creates a tangible reward for veteran players helping out newcomers. CEO Johnny Montserrat took credit for this idea and claimed it was to combat veteran players just killing or harassing newer players, as was typical in previous MUD games. As a particular player gains more and more patrons, they gain enough experience to become a monarch or have their own kingdom. They then appoint vassals who then in turn go out and recruit more patrons, further building a network that originally began as one player just helping out another. This was a very interesting mechanic, but perhaps not fully fleshed out. It didn't really work all that great on normal servers due to not having to really force players to have the same level of interaction amongst each other that was needed on the PvP server. On the Dark Tide PvP server, however, it was an entirely different story, and this is the reason why the name Dark Tide is still well known to this day. In Asheron's Call, player versus player combat only occurred when you flagged yourself as a player killer. This allowed you to be killed by other players, who could then come loot your corpse for dropped items. You didn't drop all of your items, but you dropped a number of items based on a certain kind of calculation, which is, uh, anyway, it's just a number of items, maybe five or six on average. On the Dark Tide server, however, everyone was PK flagged, making it fully a PvP server. So dying there was always risky, because it meant that you could lose some of your hard-earned items. Unfortunately, eventually people figured out how to game the loot system, where they weren't really losing too much of value whenever they died. These were called death items, meant to sort of cheat the system, if you will. Death items were items purposely taken to circumvent having to actually lose your gear. Since you could just take high-value junk items of sorts, this could make it to where you dropping your favorite gear was sort of unlikely, which is kind of a flaw in the whole system. But nonetheless, on Darktide, the allegiance system thrived. It allowed for backstabbing, it allowed for political factions, war, double agents, all of that great political stuff that's prevalent in open world PvP games. And it was also something that the offspring MMORPG Darkfall never quite picked up on either. 
The last notable mechanic I want to touch on is the magic system in Asheron's Call. Magic was originally quite rare. This was because you could only pretty much learn spells through scrolls, which in turn could only be crafted through spell research, which was a whole bunch of additional crafting in itself. Discovering the right combination of materials to create a spell was something that happened through intuition and frankly, a lot of trial and error, but it made those who did have magic seem all the more epic. What made the magic system in Asheron's Call truly genius, however, was that it had a living spell economy that determined the effectiveness of spells depending on the frequency of each spell's use on both a server-wide and personal scale. If a spell was not often used, its power increased above normal levels. The magic system rewarded experimentation and, historically speaking, is probably one of the most innovative magic systems I have seen featured in a MMO period. Unfortunately, however, with later add-ons like Split P and the Decal plugin, spell research became easy and nearly automated, making it quite easy to macro. Even though many of the systems in game were altered over time and technological advancements brought additional changes, other MMORPGs can still stand to learn an awful lot from Asheron's Call. The majority of the negative criticism aimed at Asheron's Call was in regards to its UI, which was considered very clunky and hard to navigate. I personally think it's only slightly worse than EverQuest, but I can see other people's perspective. Other negative aspects highlighted in the critiques of Asheron's Call were its strong lack of a soundtrack, poor voice acting, and overuse of sound effects that quickly became very, very annoying. <laughs> Overall, however, although it wasn't breaking the doors down like its competitor EverQuest, Asheron's Call had racked up to 90,000 subscribers by the end of the year 2000, with 200,000 box copies sold overall. These were solid numbers coming from Turbine's rather humble studio. And while Turbine was small in size, their ambitions for the game were absolutely massive. What Turbine was promising with Asheron's Call, their ultimate vision for the title, was to create a living game. As such, they provided monthly updates with storyline progression and world events to partake in, giving support to the feeling that each player could impact and affect the world around them. Asheron's Call would continue these monthly content updates for nearly its entire life as an MMORPG. Through these various updates, players experienced many unique events that played out in real time within the game. Arguably, the most notable instance of this is referred to as the Shard of the Herald event. It's hard to do justice with this perfect example of dynamic content in Asheron's Call with just words, but journalist Andrew Ross experienced the event himself and did an extensive write-up for the site Massively Overpowered. According to his account, following a year-long story arc, a war between the shadows and the players erupted once players destroyed the dark crystals that supposedly contained them. Following this action, shadows began to invade towns and slay NPCs. When the shadows eventually retreated, players thought that this was a sign that they had won. Boy were they wrong. By the next day, several towns had been annihilated by the shadows, who then proceeded to push back against the players in an attempt to siege the rest of the rare crystals. The progression of this event occurred monthly, over the course of an entire year. It allowed players to feel like the story of Asheron's Call was actually happening with urgency, and not just told through a series of points on a map to go and experience whenever you feel like it. With several events like this, Asheron's Call offered a truly emergent feeling MMORPG far ahead of its time. Asheron's Call's first true expansion, Dark Majesty, arrived in November 2001, nearly two years after the game's original launch. For $20, customers received not just the expansion, but an extra month of subscription and a copy of the original game. Whether this was a smart marketing strategy or an underpriced mistake, only time would tell. With the new expansion came new lands, a much needed UI update, and many new creatures, quests, and more to fill out the expanded map. Critics such as GameSpot and even IGN, who had previously reviewed Asheron's Call negatively, were happy with how Dark Majesty addressed several of the game's critical issues. Aided by positive reviews, Dark Majesty went gold, selling over 100,000 box copies. At the time, the population of Asheron's Call was at a reported all-time high of 120,000 subscribers. These numbers are based on estimations ultimately, but generally in my experience have been rather accurate. Richard Bartle, the guy that I mentioned previously, referenced these numbers in his book Designing Virtual Worlds as well. Things were going great for the third most popular MMORPG, but even as Dark Majesty was going gold, a new challenger was approaching. Just a few weeks earlier, in October 2001, Dark Age of Camelot had released. Mark Jacobs' latest creation was newer, slicker, and featured a casual, friendly, faction-centric warfare that resonated well with the market at the time. And so, even with the goodwill of Dark Majesty, 
Asheron's call third place spot was quickly usurped by Dark Age of Camelot. It seemed like Turbine's pride and joy was already showing its age. As such, Turbine knew that they needed to do something big to keep people interested in their game, especially since it was a subscription-based title that needed high player retention to stay afloat. And you know what they say about desperate times. The early 2000s, as it would turn out, was the age of sequels. Nothing was safe from a follow-up, not even an MMO. In fact, EverQuest would eventually get a sequel as well. But before the high-profile sequel, which you can learn more about in another one of my videos, there was Asheron's Call 2 Fallen Kings. Asheron's Call 2 Fallen Kings launched on November 22nd, 2002. Fallen Kings was set in a post-apocalyptic version of the island of Dareth where kingdoms had fallen, leaving no factions left save for the players set to roam the new now habitable lands after being driven underneath the surface many years prior. With the world almost destroyed, players are effectively there to rebuild civilization. In addition to the unique story and setting, Asheron's Call boasted a noticeably upgraded game engine and a noticeably superior graphical fidelity compared to its predecessor. You would expect that all of this would mean that Asheron's Call 2 was a massive improvement already over the first game and any of its peers. Pushing the franchise's IP into the next generation before it become outshined by its competitors was a big step forward for the brand, but creating a sequel also introduced a number of new problems. While I don't have the exact timeline for the development of Fallen Kings, it was almost certainly a much shorter development window than the three years plus that Asheron's Call had. This could be the reason why the game felt so empty. Critical reviews for the game were positive overall, but it was noted by reviewers such as GameSpot that the world itself felt bare. While there was an in-game reason for its lack of content, you know the whole apocalypse and all of that stuff, that could have just been a cover story for the fact that they rushed the game to release without fleshing it out as well as they could have. This is speculation on my part, but something certainly felt off about the sequel for many players compared to the rich expanse of the first game. There might be noticeably increased graphics in the sequel, but it ultimately feels more hollow than an AC1 due to the lifelessness of the worlds. MMORPGs during the late 90s and early 2000s experienced explosive growth, curtailing in a creation of the now long industry titan World of Warcraft in 2004. Asheron's Call 2 launched in 2002, and during its early run, it was too taxing for PCs. And then games like Star Wars Galaxies and WoW came out in 2003 and 2004 respectively, and made the new sequel look dated already. Despite the more barren world of Asheron Call's Fallen Kings, it was more positively received by critics who applauded the streamlined mechanics and impressive technical aspects of the game. PC Gamer Magazine, however, noted it was far simpler game than many veteran fans were hoping for. Despite positive critical reviews, Fallen Kings wasn't resonating with the loyal Asheron Call fans. They felt it was a departure from the core of the first game in some respects, and when you look deeper at the gameplay mechanics, it's easy to see why. First off, Asheron's Call 2 featured classes, which went against Asheron Call's 1 open skill system. Second, AC2 had an obvious focus on group content, likely looking to mirror some of what made the widely successful EverQuest, well, widely successful. But AC1 had built a reputation as a very solo-friendly MMORPG. Therefore, the change in content focus was unwanted by many core players. Asheron's Call 2 tried to fix the first game's limited appeal with more accessible gameplay, but unfortunately swung too far in the other direction and divided the player base of the smaller, at the time, fourth biggest MMORPG. In a Vice.com interview, former Asheron's Call original designer Jesse Kurlinchik was asked why he felt fans pushed back against the sequel. Kurlinchik felt that there was a real concern that the sequel would cannibalize Asheron's Call by dividing its player base and competing against its own sister game. So it was decided that Asheron's Call 2 would be a very different direction from the original. We had an engaged but small fan base for Asheron's Call, and I think there was a desire to get some of that EverQuest market share. Had Asheron's Call made the fatal mistake of pissing off their core audience by attempting to push into the EverQuest territory, devoting so many resources to a new sequel that didn't immediately satisfy their core fan base, could prove to be a costly mistake for Turbine. Despite a lackluster sequel launch, both Asheron's Call would continue operating though only in the North America region due to a lack of overseas publisher. Limited regional availability was another reason the games weren't able to draw the desired numbers. It's worth mentioning that at this point, a big reason the first game was off-putting to new players was its PvP system. As previously mentioned, you had to flag yourself as a player killer in order to PvP. This dissuaded many players from PvPing, because if you wanted to PvP in any capacity, you had to risk losing your gear. Turbine perhaps needed a way to support an array of players, from the hardcore PvPers to those just interested in trying it out. The middle ground was vital for the already declining Asheron's Call, and it wasn't supported until four years after launch when their September 2003 update, Groundswell, introduced a PK Lite system. 
The new system allowed players to flag at a lower risk. They wouldn't lose any items or their vitae, which was essentially a stat reduction, but they also wouldn't gain any experience. Although this change was late, this was an important update for expanding the accessibility of Turbine's flagship title. The end of 2003 was signaled by the announcement that Turbine was purchasing the rights to Asheron's Call as a franchise from Microsoft, assuming full responsibility of both games. Turbine still believed in Asheron's Call and wasn't ready to abandon the project yet, or perhaps Microsoft didn't really feel the same way in terms of supporting the project. In another big move, this one perhaps too late, Turbine signed with UK-based online gaming network company Jolt to run and publish Asheron's Call in Europe. Finally, five years after the launch of AC1, three years after Fallen Kings, both games were playable overseas. This change came at a time where player population and overall market share for Asheron's Call was certainly shrinking. Expanding into the European market could have either been a desperate move to keep the game alive, or just reaffirmation of Turbine's dedication to their MMOs. Even with smaller numbers, they had enough of an audience to keep the games running as subscription-based titles, and they were impressively still delivering on their monthly content update schedule. Perhaps Turbine was misguided in their dedication to a game that was already slowly declining, or perhaps the market was missing out on a pioneer in the MMORPG landscape. Whatever the case, Asheron's Call 2, likely the most endangered of the titles, received its first full expansion on May 4th, 2005. Titled Legions, this expansion expanded the world significantly, included two new races, a new land, and raising the level cap by 100 levels. Despite the new changes, there still didn't seem to be enough engaging content to get people interested in trying Asheron's Call 2 again, or even for the first time. This sentiment was shared by critics such as Ian McCafferty of Videogamer.com, who felt the expansion was great for existing players, but would be unlikely to convert non-fans. Ian also pointed out that the game was not aging well, as despite being a sequel, Fallen Kings was from 2002, and it showed. The numbers reflected this opinion, as the game was still struggling in population in 2005. By this point, World of Warcraft and EverQuest 2 had already launched, yet again it seemed like Asheron's Call was victim of circumstance. The franchise simply had really good competition, and they couldn't really do enough to garner a large audience enough to contend with the big dogs. Turbine needed Legions to be a hit, as they couldn't keep pouring money into the game if it wasn't attracting enough players. Despite the expansion being positively received overall, it needed to do more than just placate an existing user base that was too small to pay the bills. The problem was reflected in Legion's gameplay as well. With so few players, it was not uncommon to run from city to city without seeing another soul. The lack of players compounded with the design choice of a few NPCs and miles of flat, generic terrain made for a lonelier than intended experience in an already sparse game. Piggybacking off of the momentum of Fallen Kings' first expansion, the original Asheron's Call launched an expansion of its own on July 18th, 2005 titled Throne of Destiny. Throne of Destiny provided 50 new content updates, an overhauled visual engine, a new playable race, and a new expansion storyline. The expansion would be received much like Legion's, positively by those still playing the game, but with little interest from the majority of the original player base which seemed to have kind of moved on. Of particular note, reviews on Metacritic suggested that the new graphical update might be only appealing to those who actually enjoyed the original feel or look of the game in the first place. If Turbine was looking to attract a newer audience, they were going to have to do more than just impress their remaining players. At 6 years old, Asheron's Call 1 was even more dated than its sequel. And although it had the larger of the two's population, its numbers were still decreasing year after year. Throne of Destiny needed to cast a wider net for Turbine. Like with Legion, being good enough wasn't going to cut it. This, I believe, was Turbine's chance to streamline their titles and work on the new player experience, which was desperately needed. No sales, no population data is available for this time, but we know that Throne of Destiny sold worse than the previous expansion, Dark Majesty, whose release marked the highest population Asheron's Call had ever seen. Turbine now had two struggling MMORPGs, one that was dated and not approachable for new players, and a second that was uh, also dated and not approachable to new players, well and also shunned by much of the original game's player base. While the first game had a much higher population than the second, both games were losing subscribers as time went on. Instead of fighting on a unified front, Turbine had split Asheron's Call across two separate battles, and decisions were going to have to be made. Those decisions, however, would not be made under the Asheron's Call banner. Turbine acquired rights to two serious IPs and quickly proved they were no longer putting all of their eggs in the Asheron's Call basket. First, they released their Dungeons & Dragons Online in 2006, followed by their Lord of the Rings Online game a year later. Considering the amount of time, money, and effort it would take to produce two well-known MMORPGs, such as the scale of Dungeons & Dragons and Lord of the Rings, it's quite apparent that Asheron's Call was probably not a big focus for Terabine anymore. 
Not when you have Lord of the Rings and Dungeons and Dragons IPs. In August 2005, it was announced that unfortunately, Asheron's Call 2 was scheduled to be shut down later that year. Community Relations Director Jonathan Hannon said that the biggest contributing factor for Turbine's decision was the subscriber numbers. Hanna said that Turbine tried many ways to keep the game running, but after the Legion's expansion, the title's fate was pretty much sealed. Turbine poured marketing and developmental resources into the expansion, hoping that it would attract more players, but the gamble didn't pay off. When it didn't, they simply couldn't run the game profitably anymore, and thus the time of death was called for Asheron's Call to December 30th, 2005. According to Engadget's Game Archaeologist highlight of Asheron's Call 2, the game at its height of popularity peaked at around 50,000 players. This number had plummeted to 15,000 after a couple of years later, and those numbers simply weren't enough for Turbine to justify monthly content updated and continuous maintenance. What follows is a final note from Turbine themselves concerning the shutdown of Asheron's Call 2. Empyrean magic has once again fled this world. The battle for Dareth continues on a different plane now. As his final act in this realm, Asheron sealed every portal to contain the expanding horde and protect what is left of the races who called Dareth home. As of December 30th, 2005, the AC2 service is no longer available. Turbine and the AC2 development team would like to express our thanks to the many players who've been a part of Asheron's Call 2 over the years. We hope you had as much fun playing the game as we did creating it for you. It's never easy to say goodbye to a place you've called home, but we hope to see all of you in Turbine's other worlds. And on that note, Asheron's Call 2 was dead. And although the sequel was gone, the original Asheron's Call continued to operate, even as Turbine was purchased by Warner Brothers Home Entertainment in April of 2010. While there were no immediate differences following the acquisition, it was still possible that the purchase would have negative effects for the game down the road. And all the while, Asheron's Call would continue to chug on with a very humble population all the way into 2012. And then, in a surprising move on December 13th, 2012, Turbine announced that they would be bringing back Asheron's Call 2, promising beta access to all Asheron's Call 1 subscribers. Asheron's Call 2 had seen some light. It seemed that Turbine wanted to entice their loyal AC1 fans with the resurrected AC2, likely believing that the sequel was their best chance at a continued success, monetary or otherwise. After all, AC2 had the relatively newer and more improved engine, which would be the tech that Turbine ultimately would prefer. Perhaps resurrecting AC2 was a last-ditch effort to capitalize on any perceived potential they had believed that it had over AC1. After its new lease on life, Fallen Kings would receive little additional support, making it odd why they bothered to bring it back in the first place. Monthly content updates for the original game would continue up until May 2014, at which point things went strangely quiet. Because of this, it wasn't too far-fetched to speculate that the demise of both Asheron's Call games, for real this time, was on the horizon. Turns out this hiatus could have been due to Turbine spending the time and resources on a switch to a buy to play model for Asheron's Call, which came in August 2014. Up until this point, both Asheron's Call had been subscription based games. There was still some confusion, however, as the Asheron's Call series went buy to play, while their other big title, Lord of the Rings Online, went free to play, and had been free to play for four years. Why did it take so long to change Asheron Call's business model? And why go buy to play instead of following their already proven model of free to play? A change in business model can be a saving grace for some games. For Asheron's Call, however, it seemed like a death sentence. The rest of 2014 and most of 2015 were severely lacking in updates. Many people consider this two year period a maintenance mode of sorts. And we know how much MMO fans hate to hear the term maintenance mode. At this point, Turbine was losing interest in MMORPGs as a whole, and it's hard to blame them from a business perspective. With Lord of the Rings Online and Dungeons and Dragons Online not doing particularly spectacularly, Turbine was in a desperate need of a company restructure, which unfortunately meant layoffs. News of the layoffs broke on July 8th, 2016, along with the announcement that Turbine would be transitioning to mobile games. To facilitate this change in focus, Turbine would be spinning off the teams of their two licensed titles, Dungeons and Dragons Online and Lord of the Rings Online, into a new studio called Standing Stone Games. Turbine would no longer be involved in either game. But what about Asheron's Call? And Asheron's Call 2, which was newly resurrected. Asheron's Call was a Turbine IP, and its future was, for a time, uncertain. Standing Stone Games would not be taking the Asheron's Call IP with them, and Turbine was moving out of the MMORPG space. So what of their flagship franchise? It soon came to light that both Asheron's Call titles were to be closed down on January 31st, 2017. The Asheron's Call IP is still owned by Warner Brothers, and they're kind of just sitting on it. After 17 years of Asheron's Call and a combined 10 years of Fallen Kings, both titles began the sunsetting process. When the news hit the web, 
It devastated the fans who stuck with the franchise, even as it began its slow descent. Many fans said that they never thought it would leave. They kind of thought that Asheron's call would be around forever, but on January 31st, 2017, it shut down for good. PC Gamer produced a video on the last moments of Asheron's call. I really recommend watching it because it's an emotional watch. You get to see people who spent a significant part of their lifetime in this other world celebrate and mourn its last moments, and then they stand by as it shut down, closing off their access to Arberian forever. MMORPGs are more than just games. When done right, they are living and breathing worlds. At least that's how they're supposed to be done. Asheron's Call, despite its flaws, was a good game. But better yet, it was a fantastic world. That's why it makes people so emotional. That's why players can't compose themselves as they watch one of their favorite worlds cease to exist. To them, it's a second home, one they can never go back to. It's the sort of loss that only comes with the closing of a huge chapter in one's life, knowing it's time to leave it behind for good. There was an outpouring of support from YouTubers and fans from all over as the game took its last breaths, hoping they could purchase the Asheron's Call IP, or Warner Brothers could at least allow people to utilize the source code to keep the game alive. While these pleas meant the world to the players who were coping with the loss of such a vital part of their gaming world, they were ultimately unsuccessful. But dedicated Asheron's fans weren't giving up just yet. Through community efforts and emulation, multiple teams were trying to get new Asheron's Call servers up and running. They wanted to desperately continue to preserve the game's culture, its history, and frankly, its art. As expected from the big corporate entity like Warner Brothers, what greeted these dedicated community members and their noble efforts to keep their favorite MMORPG alive and not forgotten was a big fat cease and desist letter. It's so sad that many of these episodes end so similarly. Beloved game is dying or dead, dedicated fans sign a petition to run a community server or at least crowdfund to buy the license, the big business shuts down efforts in order to protect its best interests, which are money, so then therefore the business makes no money because nobody's really using the IP, including them, but then nobody else does either and nobody else also gets to try the game out. Even in 2019, you can find more information about possible Asheron Calls emulator servers. They might slow us down, but they will never stop us. Preserving our culture as MMO fans is paramount amount at this point. MMOs aren't just games, they are living and breathing worlds. And it's a shame that such a wonderful world like Asheron's Call could cease to exist. Asheron's Call was an MMORPG with a unique allegiance system, aimable magic and projectile mechanics, rare magic with a live spell economy, a 500 square mile world, and monthly content updates with quests story for over a decade. And it started in 1999. It was an absolutely impressive MMORPG. Now that we've examined the evidence, it's time to compile the clues and deduce the major reasons for the deaths of Asheron's Call 1 and 2. If you missed a few clues, fear not! A detective dons his fedora, and voice changer and attempts to solve a mystery. I'm not gonna use the voice changer, but I figured I'd throw that in there for some pizzazz. Shoutouts to Conan. Asheron's Call wasn't lacking in complexity, or depth. However, combined with a poor UI and documentation, this kept many new players away from the game. Launching a sequel a mere three years after launching your original game usually means you're splitting your audience in the MMO world, and that's kind of a death sentence. Stiff competition meant that every time that Asheron's Call 1 or 2 made a blunder, they suffered all the more, and then they continued to get outpaced. Asheron's Call 2, as a consequence of improving its visuals, was too graphically demanding for most PCs at the time. AC2's low subscriber count so early in its life doomed it from the start. For a game that needs constant developer content on a monthly basis, if you don't have enough players playing the game period, they can't support that kind of content model. The game just doesn't work. It's quite apt that although AC1 was able to initially outlive AC2, in the end, they died side by side. It's very rare on this series when we examine a game in which, under slightly different circumstances, could have turned out very differently. For better or for worse, games don't exist in bubbles. As such, sometimes even good games like Asheron's Call don't quite reach the levels of success they perhaps should have. There are a few times where Turbine perhaps could have zigged when they should have zagged or whatever else, but some aspects of AC's demise were ultimately out of their hands. They were in some ways a victim of circumstance, and that's kind of how the market works, especially when it's living and breathing. Could Asheron's Call perhaps been a more humble project? Sure. And for that matter, Dark Age of Camelot, Star Wars Galaxies, Ultima Online, EverQuest, and Shadowbane <laughs> could have all been more humble as well. But the MMORPGs of old had all one thing in common. They were bold. Those MMOs were unique, ambitious, and they put it all on the line. 
I hope after watching this video, you will think fondly of Asheron's Call, of how it soared to the same heights as EverQuest and Ultima Online once upon a time. It goes to show that you can't know your limits until you're tested, and Asheron's Call learned its limits the hard way. But despite its downfall, Asheron's Call deserves its place in history right next to Ultima Online and EverQuest as one of the three big original MMORPGs. And while Asheron's Call 1 and 2 might have faced their demise back in 2017, their influence can still be felt in the MMORPG world today. With the rise of early access titles such as Project Gorgon, which targets the same core values Asheron's Call once coveted, it's wonderful to see newer MMORPGs such as Project Gorgon, which see Asheron's Call as a spiritual successor, taking inspirations from such a truly innovative game. As long as the future MMORPGs continue to learn from the mistakes of the MMOs of old and not lose the desire to push those boundaries that most of the old pioneers had pushed, the genre will continue to be chock full of exciting games to come. But to be honest, I don't think we're ever going to get another MMO quite like Asheron's Call. It truly was a one-of-a-kind experience. And although it might not see light again for a while, the world of Alberian can exist all around us in our memories, in our shared experiences, and of course, this video. So whenever you're feeling nostalgic, feel free to come back and watch this video, or watch any video on Asheron's Call. And hopefully someday, there's a chance we can still play the game. Maybe it's not too late to preserve Asheron's Call. Such a work of art deserves to be preserved. I sincerely hope you guys enjoyed this video. I feel honored to have chronicled and analyzed such an innovative and bold MMORPG. Thanks for watching, guys. Pieces! <laughs>